Good morning. At least it's morning when I'm recording this. I don't know what time of day it is when when you're watching, but glad you are. Um, it is hard to believe that we are in uh, July now. Uh, July 2nd of the longest year in the history of the world. Or at least it feels like that in some ways, doesn't it? Uh, all that we have been through this year, uh, a global pandemic, all the, the uh, social unrest that has occurred and is occurring. Um, and let's see, we've been through the murder hornet and now the Saharan dust cloud and who knows what's next. Uh, but here we are alive and well and, and glad to be in God's world and continuing to seek his wisdom. At least that's the purpose of these videos. We're, we're in the study, the quest for wisdom. And uh, we have sort of introduced um, this material, which is a look mostly at the wisdom books of the Old Testament. As I said, uh, when we introduced this, a lot of this material was uh, prepared for a college course on this topic, uh, the wisdom books of the Old Testament, Old Testament wisdom literature. And um, we're sort of adapting it for this format and hope it's a benefit to you. Uh, but we're also incorporating some New Testament perspectives, and uh, there's certainly wisdom-type literature and teaching in the New Testament. So we'll see that as we go along, too. But we've spent some time sort of um, introducing this and, and getting us in the flow of it and understanding what to expect when we open up such books, such writing in Scripture. And uh, today we're going to um, open up one of the wisdom books. So uh, I thought it would be good to start with the book of Job, this, this great story of this man who, as, as I describe it, sort of went on this life adventure with God and uh, learned some very important things. So we will introduce Job today. We'll get into a little bit the early passages of Job. Um, we did send out to those of you on our email list um, a handout, which is basically just an outline of the book of Job. It looks uh, like this. You can see that. It basically outlines the structure of Job, which we'll, um, we'll address in this session. Uh, there's no blanks to fill in or anything like that on it, but uh, uh, it, is, it is available to you if you want to to uh, download that. So let's start out with some introductory facts and figures about the book and then we'll, like I said, uh, look at a few texts in the early part of Job. Just some basic facts about Job. You know, Job is really one of the best known books of the Bible uh, to, uh, we might say, non-believers or to people who only consider scripture in light of its literary uh, qualities. And what I mean by that is you might well find sections of Job in a literature textbook, an English lit textbook, uh, because it is appreciated for its literary value uh, in even secular settings. Uh, and it, so in that sense, it is pretty well known. And just the name Job is pretty well known, uh, even if not a lot is known about him really, or the content of the book. So it is um, relatively well known compared to other books in Scripture. It's also one of the most difficult texts of the Bible to translate. So if you're working from the original language, which of course is Hebrew in the Old Testament, and you're trying to translate it into English or whatever language, it is notoriously difficult to do so. Uh, there may be a lot of reasons for that, but that won't go into, but it is hard stuff, hard sledding to translate. And uh, along with that is the fact that it is a pretty hard book to interpret, or at least it has been misinterpreted so often down through the centuries, and in ways that are meaningful, 
that is, a lot of damage has been done by misunderstandings of Job, even in within the, the confines of um, the time of the Bible. So people misunderstood the point of what happened to Job. Um, even in the time of Jesus, we see this reflected, and, and we'll eventually address that. Uh, the setting, let's talk a little bit about the setting of the book of Job, which is quite fascinating because when you look at it closely, you know, the setting seems to be the what we would call the patriarchal era of history. So when we talk about patriarchs, we're, we're talking about people like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Abraham, you know, uh, circa 2000 BC, um, in, in that era. And really with Job, if you take what is said in the book, literally, we would probably put Job before Abraham even. So before the time of the patriarchs. Now, why do we say that? Well, one of the things we notice in the first chapter, which we'll read portion of here in a little bit, is that there is, it does not seem that there's a priesthood yet. There's not a professional class of, of religious leaders, the priests who offer the sacrifices. Chapter 1, verse 5, Job is offering sacrifices, burnt offerings for his family. And that's usually the role of priests in Scripture when there's a priesthood. But before there were priests, the heads of the family would lead in worship and offer the sacrifices um, to um, intercede for their family members with God. And uh, Job seems to be doing that himself. And so that would that's one reason we put him back in that patriarchal era uh, it also might be reflective of, of the fact that Job may be a non-Israelite um, outside of the typical line that we usually trace with people and families in Scripture. Another reason uh, we would put Job so long ago, comparatively, is that he has this extremely long lifespan. Um, when we meet Job, he obviously is a mature man. Um, he has raised a family, has a large family and so forth. And so, you know, whatever that age is in chapter one, we're not sure. But uh, when you read the last chapter, uh, Job chapter 42, in particular verse 16, after everything in the Job story has happened, it says that Job continues on and lives another 140 years. So you take however old he was, we don't really know at the beginning of the story, was he 40, 50, 60, or more? And then add 140 to that, and you've got a guy likely over 200 years old, and when you compare that with other lifespans in Scripture, that's even more ancient than Abraham. So we're getting back before Abraham, possibly, with Job. And, uh, and so another reason why we put him very early in the, in the time frame of Scripture. Uh, no author is named of this book. Uh, that is often the case with the wisdom books. Uh, authorship is not specified. There's no author that we're aware of of Job. Any authors that have been suggested for Job are just done so sort of guessing or by tradition, uh, not by reading the text. There's nothing that says so-and-so wrote this. Um, and also there's no date specified. So, you know, some books of the Old Testament and New give great clues as to exactly when they were written. Uh, this is not the case with Job and in general with the wisdom books. We usually don't have a specific date. Uh, there are no great uh, historical references in the book that would help us date with any specificity uh, the, the events of Job. Again, uh, this idea that it seems to almost be a non-Israelite background for the book. Uh, one indicator of this is the, 
the setting that's mentioned, chapter 1, verse 1. The story is set in the land of Uz, and we just don't know where that was. Uh, no one knows where Uz was. Uh, some people guess that maybe it was northeast of Israel, uh, but we really have no certain idea of where this land was that it says Job was from. And so again, we're sort of clueless on that. Uh, some people, based on these things, suggest that Job might be about the oldest book uh, in the Bible, and if so, maybe the oldest book in the world. Um, and it just has a lot of characteristics of being very ancient. Job himself, uh, the individual, is mentioned not just in this book, but three other times in the Bible. So. Um, a couple of those mentions are in the Old Testament. If you go to the prophet Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 14, both in verses 14 and 20 of that chapter, Job is mentioned. And he, he's mentioned in a, in a small list of names. And what is emphasized there about Job is his righteousness. So we have Job uh, mentioned in the prophecy of Ezekiel. Then also, uh, he is mentioned in the New Testament in the book of James. James chapter 5, verse 11, Job is mentioned. And uh, if you've watched our previous sessions on this study, um, we linked James with the wisdom literature. A lot of James sounds like Proverbs, for instance. So it's interesting that James is the one person in the New Testament who mentions Job. Um, but uh, James chapter 5, verse 11, mentions this, this person, this great man, Job, and he emphasizes the steadfastness of Job. So those are the other times we see a reference to, to uh, this individual. I want to, before we get into the text, um, talk a little bit about the way the book is structured. I think it's important for understanding and for interpreting. Uh, Job is a lengthy, what we might call wisdom debate. Uh, it's really a long poem uh, where individuals are debating back and forth um, issues of wisdom and what's going on and that kind of thing. And um, that long poem is enclosed, it's uh, wrapped in by two very brief prose sections. So two non-poetry sections at the beginning and end, and then the long wisdom poem debate in the middle. Um, the, the two prose sections are chapters one and two uh, at the beginning, which we'll start into here in a bit, and then chapter 42, verses 7 through 17 at the end. Uh, or, or, or the other non the, is the other non poetry section. So chapter th beginning chapter three verse one through chapter forty two verse six is this lengthy debate set in poetry between Job, his companions, and God, and they're the principal speakers throughout that section. And that section of poetry and, and debate itself is bracketed at the beginning by a lament that Job speaks, chapter 3, verses 1 through 26. What's a lament? It's a cry, it's a mourning of something that has happened. Uh, we have an entire book of the Bible, the book of Lamentations, tucked right after Jeremiah that laments the fall of the city of Jerusalem. Uh, but Job laments the fact that he was even born. His suffering is so great, he, he laments the day of his birth in chapter 3. So that's sort of how this wisdom debate begins. And then towards the end of the lengthy poem, uh, you have a complaint or a defense given by Job of uh, his perspective on things. This is in chapters 29, 30, and 31. 
And then something else happens just after that, uh, which we'll eventually get to. Um, but that's a little bit of the, the uh, skeleton, the structure of the way the book is set up, just to help us break it down a bit. Uh, I don't think I mentioned earlier, plan is not to go through this lengthy book um, verse by verse or even paragraph by paragraph, but uh, to, to uh, sort of survey it in a quick way. And that's why we're spending some time in, in giving us a, a, a good overview here. One other thing to mention in introduction is um, the characters in, in Job. Um, several people appear in the book. Of course, Job, the title character, and then God is a character in the book. And then we have Satan, or if we were to translate literally, uh, he is called the Satan. Um, we might, instead of um, saying the Satan, call him the accuser or the adversary. But he plays a prominent role, especially early in the book. And then Job's wife. We do not have her name. She's anonymous. Uh, but she makes an appearance. And then you have these friends or companions of Job, which play a big role. And they say a lot of things. Um, there are three primary friends uh, that come to Job in his suffering, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. And they will engage in this debate with Job, each taking their turn, and then Job responding in, in suggesting what's going on, why it's going on, and so forth. And that makes up the bulk of the book. And then after all those cycles of speeches between Job and each of his three friends, after that is all done, and then Job makes his complaint or defense at the end, chapters 29 through 31, uh, a, a latecomer to the debate shows up. Another friend, that we might call him, uh, he's sort of mysterious, but his name is Elihu, and he, he sort of comes in at the end and it seems like he's younger than the rest of them. And he says, oh, you guys all got it wrong. Let me tell you what happened. And he takes his time in explaining um, what happened to Job and giving advice about how to fix it. Uh, but um, those are the principal characters in, in this book. And just to wrap this up... Um, four themes, four major themes that are addressed in this book. Uh, number one, the sovereignty of God is an emphasis. That is that God is in charge. Um, you know, that is questioned at times by Job and his friends, especially Job. Uh, but at the end, by the end, God has clearly shown that he's in charge. And that's a major point of the book, God's sovereignty, his power, his in chargeness of the world and the universe. Uh, another theme is the justice or goodness of God. The technical term for that in theology is the word theodicy. And so uh, you'll, you'll see references to this if you read uh, commentaries and and articles on Job, uh, discussion of theodicy. That is, is God just? Is God good? That's at debate in this book. And, um, and, and so that's a definite theme. A third theme is Satan and his work, what he's about, and, and the kinds of things he does. And then f fourth and finally, uh, the proper response to suffering. Uh, I remember early in my life when I was sort of learning the books of the Bible and taught themes of the books that sometimes um, people said of Job, the book of Job, that the purpose of the book was to explain suffering. And it really isn't. If you're looking for an explanation of why we suffer, um, you will be disappointed in Job. It's not there. There's no explanation. Um, but 
there is a a um, a teaching about how to respond to suffering, and that may be even more important. So that's a a, a major theme. I'd like us to uh, take a moment and read the first paragraph of chapter one, uh, verses one through five, and pull a, a few things out of there as we. Uh, consider the opening of the book. I think we're ready to do that. Some of these we um, addressed in the first uh, couple of videos on the wisdom books, but just getting into the text a bit here. Again, uh, the book begins, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and, and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. So again, that's the introductory paragraph to the book, the first five verses. And so, again, we have these notes about Job here that he's called the greatest man in the East. The greatest man in the East. Um, we just have a direction. We don't have any more uh, information to locate that other than it says he was from the land of Uz. And again, we don't know where that is or was. And uh, and so you have a couple of notes, but we, we can't make a lot of them. And then, um, again, this idea that the setting seems to reflect this patriarchal system of worship where the, the father of the family is the one who's leading people before God. That is, Job is offering sacrifices on behalf of his children in fear that they may have sinned and offended God. He offers burnt offerings. Uh, clearly, there's not a priesthood that's doing that. There's not a temple that they go to and worship. And so it seems uh, to be a very ancient time whenever this occurred. And then uh, the opening verse and, and the ones that follow there, uh, one thing to keep in mind is that it sort of portrays how people thought life ought to be uh, for the righteous, uh, how it ought to be. That is, that you have this great man who's good and, and tries to do good and, and is righteous, and good things happen to him. So, if you're good, good things happen to you the way things ought to be. Ought to be. That's, that's how people thought, and frankly, it's probably how people still think, uh, isn't it? We think if we do good, we ought to get good. Uh, and this has been the way people have thought through the centuries. But what we're going to find out in the rest of the book is that, that life isn't always ideal. Um, we see how life, how real life sometimes is, and why. And uh, it isn't the case always that if you're good, good things happen, and if you're bad, bad things happen. It may indeed be the case that that bad things happen to good people, and good things to bad people. And that sort of sets up. Um, one of the great issues of, of this wisdom book. Let's go on and read the next little section, verses 6 through 12, and that'll be it for, uh, for this time. So it continues in verse 6, Now there was a day 
when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is, is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now, one of the things that I always think it's important to point out is that as far as we know, Job never knows about what we just read. That, that the individual character Job never knows what happens in these scenes that take place in the throne room of God where they're discussing him, where God and Satan are discussing him. We know those things because the one who wrote the book records them, but Job doesn't. There's no evidence that he knows. And, um, and that might change our understanding of, of his reactions and so forth. And, you know, we might, we might wonder, is this typical? Is this the kind of thing that happens in the councils of God? Is God discussing me or you? with our adversary. I don't know about that, uh, but he did on, on this occasion. And uh, a second thing in relation to that is, who is it that really initiates Job's problems? Uh, if you were telling the story of Job from your familiarity with it, you would probably say Satan. Satan's the one who brings Job's problems on him. And in a, to a degree, that's true. But, but, but notice here, look very closely, who brings Job up? Not Satan. God. God is the one who, who raises the issue of Job. He says, have you considered my servant Job? Well, you know, we might well ask, what's God doing here? And I imagine Job, if he'd have known about this, may have had some questions. Why bring my name up? You know, what is God doing initiating this process? It's an interesting thing to think about. And then the whole question of who is this Satan character? Who is the Satan um, and, and why is he in in heaven, uh, not called heaven here, but in the council area of God? You know, he appears along with the, the other servants of God, or they're called here the sons of God, who present themselves before the Lord. Uh, Satan, in some sense, appears to be among them. He uh, appears as a servant of the Lord who has access to the divine assembly. We'll see this repeated in chapter 2. It happens on another occasion. And so that might surprise us that that the leader of all evil um, has access to the counsel of God, at least at this time. Uh, Satan, whoever he is, and, and we sort of bring our preconceived thoughts and notions about Satan, mostly learned in the New Testament, uh, to texts like this, but if all you had was the book of Job, you'd be greatly mystified by who Satan is. There's just not much about him. He's referred to by name 
also in a couple of other places in the Old Testament. So we have uh, a reference to Satan in 1 Chronicles chapter 21 and verse 1. Uh, you might look that up and, and see what that's about. That Satan is specifically named there. And then also in the minor prophet, it, uh, Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 3 verses 1 and 2, Satan is named. And there he's um, doing what his name says he does. He's accusing a righteous person. Um, but the, as far as the, the word or the name Satan, those are all the places here in Job and in these two other passages we mentioned. We might say that he appears other places by other names. For instance, in the early chapters of Genesis, he appears as the serpent who is tempting Eve and Adam. Uh, but he's not named there Satan. Um, but he normally is some kind of instigator or accuser or adversary of God's people. And that's, uh, that's how he is usually described. Uh, a lot more to be said about him. The uh, thing I wanted to finish on with this, though, is verse 9 that we read. Uh, because in, in one sense, that the content of that verse may be the central theme of the entire book of Job. Again, God brings Job up. He, he says to Satan, Have you considered or noticed my servant Job? What a great guy he is, how righteous, and so forth. And uh, Satan says in response, he says, Does Job fear God for no reason? That might be the theme of the book. What's he What's he saying there? You know, he goes on and he, he says, you know, you you protected Job. You've built this protective hedge around him. Everything he does, you bless. You've made him rich, wealthy in so many ways. Sure, he worships you and serves you. But would he do so if you took anything away from him? And then we see the rest of the book is sort of an answer to that question. Does Job fear God for no reason? Will he serve God even if he has a bad day or many bad days, even if those things that he holds most precious are removed from him? Will, will Job serve God? Uh, that's a great issue in the book of Job. And we get an answer to that. We may not get an answer to the reason for suffering, specifically, but we will get an answer to the question, will a man, a woman, serve God for the right reason? Uh, thank you for tuning in and, and following along. I hope this is a interesting and, and and a study that is a source of blessing for you. Let us all be on this great quest for life's most precious commodity, wisdom, and especially um, the, the greatest expression of God's wisdom, his Son, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, until next time, may God's blessings be upon you. We'll see you.